Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast. Praise the Lord. Good to see everybody this, this morning. I appreciate the spirit of praise. And thank God it's not just something where we can come together and sing and feel good. There's a reason behind it. Praise the Lord. Well, you know, last week we focused on Colossians 2 and 3. And the title of the message was, I, I think it wound up being all and in all. And it focused on Christ and the fact that what we have is not religion but a person. The answer to everything is not, not policies and procedures and, and uh, all those kinds of things, but it's a person. And, uh, you know, my mind went back to one of the scriptures, though. There's a, there's a point that I feel like is critical. I certainly came up in my own life this week when I came face to face with a need, and then immediately there was a thought that came to me. And it, it was connected with this passage, and it's in Colossians chapter 2. One of the scriptures we focused on, but there's one aspect of it, like I say, that we did not. In verse 6, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. So the one, po uh, one point that I have often made out of this verse is that the principle by which we're saved in the first place is the principle by which we live. There's not two different things. There's this constant sense where I need something I don't have and the answer is in Christ. Everything that I need is in Him. But there is a, you know, language is a funny thing. There are no two languages where there is a word that has the exact equivalent in another language. There is a range of meaning within this culture of a certain word that's used. If it, you take it over here and you'd have to translate it sort of one way or another and it doesn't quite capture the whole meaning. And one of the verse, one of the words that uh, jumped out at me, as I said this week, was the word received. And in English, the word received almost has a passive con connotation. It's like I'm sitting there and I get a package and I receive it and I sign for it and all of that, but it's, there's not a lot of action on my part. It, I'm, I'm sort of passive to it. And there's a lot of the gospel that's preached today that's a little bit like that. It's so simplistic that I just accept it. I just receive it. And that's about all there is to it, almost. But there is an action part of this that is that we can easily overlook, and we can, we can get stuck in the mode where we're asserting all that Christ is, but not benefiting as we should, and we're stuck in our individual lives in certain areas. And I won't ask for a show of hands how many people who are, you know, in that place where you're sort of stuck. I mean, you know that there's things that, that Christ has provided, but somehow we're not, you know, you're not enjoying that. And I certainly would have to raise my hands because it is a journey and we do face uh, things all along and issues all along where we need that change that we were singing about this morning. The Lord's changing us, isn't he? Thank God he is. Thank God he will continue that work until that day. And the, the end of it is a certainty for everyone that has genuinely given their heart to him. But there is, most of the time, if you were to trace that Greek word through the New Testament, it does not say receive, it says take. Now, that's quite a difference, isn't it? If I just receive something, that's one thing. But if I, you know, I'm, I'm just really, you know, I'm, I'm asserting my part. There's a part that I play where I am reaching out and I am taking that. And that's what I felt like in my own experience that was lacking, that there was an area where I wasn't taking. Christ was offering. It was available. It was there. But I wasn't really aggressively taking and that is an aspect of truth. that I, We need that, that balance. Thank God for everything God has done. He has provided everything, and not only did he provide it, but he came seeking us. He came convicting us so that we would have an, a heart-level belief, a conviction that we need him and that he's the answer. Because that's the only foundation for, for approaching him and coming to him. There's nothing in us that would ever do that. So it's God, but there's a point at which he looks for a response. You know, I think I've mentioned before, and I don't remember if it was last week or not, but there are some that so emphasize the sovereignty of God that it's almost like we have very little responsibility. And others that so emphasize the response of man that it's like God is a beggar trying to sign us up for some better plan than for our life. But there is an awesome 
provision of God that is sovereign. He is in charge. The question is not whether he's sovereign. The question is how does he use that sovereignty? And he uses that to appeal to, to men, to convict them, but to bring us to a point of real surrender. But it's, not, it's more than just an acquiescence where we just say, okay, I give in. There, I'll tell you, we've got things to overcome. And I follow a number of scriptures, and I just want to kind of go through some of these and, and balance this truth out, or at least enlarge upon it, show what that meaning of that word really is. Receive, again, is more than just, you know, a, a passive thing. How about Matthew chapter 11? Matthew chapter 11 is uh, a passage where Jesus was asked about John the Baptist, who had, was the forerunner, who came announcing that he was coming. And Jesus said this was very interesting in verse 12 of chapter 11 of Matthew. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. Well, now, one thing that we mentioned last week is certainly contained in that, and that's the fact that God's, what God is doing in the world is a divine invasion. That could easily have been the title. But there is an invasion that God is doing that is forceful and it's mighty, and it's invading the devil's territory to rescue people for, for eternity. But that's not the whole of it, is it? Because it says forceful men lay hold of it. There is an effort, there is a, there's an opposition any time you and I would try to move toward the kingdom of God. I know you know that if you know the Lord at all. You know that this doesn't come without opposition. And the question is, what do we do about that? Do we just sort of say, oh, it's not for me, or a thousand and one uh, responses that would cause us to stop short of what God has provided fully when he wants us to put forth some genuine effort and yet, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but thank God it's not a self-effort, but there's an effort. There is an absolute reaching forth that, that has to be, where our, our will has to be geared up, and there's an insistence about it. You know, one uh, picture that came back to my mind is one I've mentioned before, and that's from Pilgrim's Progress. When you remember early in, in uh, the journey where, Pilgrim, where, where Christian was headed for the celestial city, he came to the house of the interpreter. And the purpose of that was to learn some spiritual truth, and this was prior to his actually encountering the cross and, feeling, and, and losing his burden, but he learned some things. One of the things that he learned, the interpreter showed him a beautiful castle, and everyone in that castle was, was happy and healthy and rejoicing, and it just looked like a wonderful place to be. And outside of that castle were a number of very strong soldiers who were, who were standing there with swords to oppose anybody who would try to get in that castle. And there was a company of men who acted like, I'd sure like to be in there. But they looked at, these, they looked at this opposition and they just, they, they were afraid. They backed off. They wouldn't go. And then he saw one, one man go up to a, a table where someone, someone was writing down the names of those who were going in and gave him his name, put on his armor, and he just took off one man against all of these, and he just valiantly fought his way through and then was received into the castle. Folks, that's a better picture of salvation than a lot that's preached. I'll tell you, if anybody gets saved, it's going to be against a whole lot of stuff that's going on in here. You've got enemies in here that will not yield, that don't want to don't want to surrender, that you want to bargain with God, there's a thousand and one things that will stop you from really entering the kingdom of God. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to be able to push, that, push through that. There's going to have to be a willingness, not just to passively say, okay, Lord, put the salvation in my back pocket, a ticket to heaven, and I'll go on with my life. This is something, this is an all or nothing kind of thing. And I'll tell you, you won't get to that place until you realize the stakes that this is an all or nothing question. We are either going to be destroyed or we're going to live forever with him and the, the, only, the price of salvation is our life. And you're going, to have the, you're going to have the devil whispering in your ear a thousand and one things that will cause you to say, wait a minute, what about this, what about that? And we're going to have to be willing to push through. 
And so just even coming to Christ, this is not some simple little, okay, God, I'll go along with you kind of thing. God is looking for people who are dead serious. You remember how the, remember the parable of the, uh, of the sower? You had some that had no, that the seed had no effect on their hearts and their minds. They just were so seared, so hardened. But there were, there were two other categories of people whose li- upon whose lives and upon whose hearts the seed of the Word of God fell. One of them, the soil was shallow. Boy, does that picture a lot of the American church. I mean, you know, the idea of forgiveness of sins, being a friend of God, getting to go to heaven one day, pray, yeah, why not? I'll, I'll go along. I'll be willing to go, go to church and, and take up that lifestyle and all that. Yeah, who, who doesn't want a deal like that? And, uh, but what happens? The problem is underneath it's rocky. There are issues in the heart that have never been touched, never been confronted. Self is still on the throne. The principle of sin still rules, and it doesn't take but the right circumstances for them to say, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for this. You know, I've said many times, when persecution comes to this country, how many people, how many, how many people will still identify as with Christ? It's going to change a lot, isn't it? That's what's happening in India right now. They're, they're undergoing a very particular persecution, and it's, it's growing. But we, we can stand with our brothers there. But you know it's having good fruit? God always advances his kingdom in the face of whatever the devil throws. We're asleep here. We don't know what's going on. We, we, you know, if you, if you have any awareness at all, you can see the forces of, the, of darkness gathering. And all it takes is the right circumstances, and the things are going to change dramatically. And, but God's getting his people ready. I'm not, we don't, he doesn't call on us to, upon us to fear. But anyway, there is, a, there is a battle to fight to get into the kingdom. When, and I mentioned the, uh, the parable of the sower. The other one was somebody who, uh, yeah, they accepted the word. That was great. And they started to produce something. And then, but then the cares of this world took over. They were more interested in this world. That was the real priority. The true priority of their life was what they could you know, what they could get out of this world, what uh, their life in it, all the issues connected with it. The kingdom of God was not the center. Folks, for God's people, God's kingdom is the bottom line. And you're going to have a, you're going to have a fight on your hands if you enter this kingdom. But I'll tell you, the glorious thing is when we fight, when we agree and say, yes, Lord, I want this with all of my heart, you're going to find out that God will come along and help you. You're going to find out it's not, not up to your strength at all. All of a sudden, God comes on the scene. That's what grace is about. It's by grace that we're saved. God has to help us. But when our wills align with his truth and with his provision and his purpose, he, and we set our hearts to do what he says, he will come on the scene, and we're going to find out we're not alone. That's real salvation. That's the principle by which people come in. Now, I thought about another scripture that, that is closely connected with this, and I think it's in uh, Luke 13, if I remember correctly. Yeah, this is, this is one we used to hear a lot and need, to, and need to not forget that it's in the book. Jesus was going from village to village, verse 22, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Well, he didn't directly answer it, but in a, indirectly he did. He said, he said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Now, how do you put that together with just accepting Jesus or receiving him. I mean, I realize there's a, sometimes that can, deci- that can describe something that is genuine. Thank God for every time it does. But oh, there's so much, there's such, so much deeper truth in that. Because here are people who actually are making some kind of an effort. They see the kingdom of God to some degree, and they're trying to enter it, and they want to enter it, but they're not able to. Why in the world? Is God trying to keep them out? Does anybody here think that God's just trying to block the door and say, no, you can't come in. I don't care how hard you try. You're not. No, that's not it. What's the issue? The issue is there's something they're not willing to let go. 
at some point, there, has, there is a choice that has to be made regarding the kingdom of God and something in their life. I mean, you, I'm sure everybody by now has thought about the rich young ruler. Classic example. Here was a young, here was a young man who was zealous for serving God with everything he knew, which was the Jews' religion and the law of Moses, and he'd kept it from the time he was a boy. He was scrupulous about it. He was, he was zealous toward God and all of that. And so he comes and said, I've done all the things that you, as you talked about. Oh, what, you know, what else do I lack? And Jesus said, sell what you have, give it to the poor, and come and take up your cross and follow me. Now, that's not a general command to everybody, but that was the God of his, of his life, wasn't it? That was the issue. There was a narrow door there, and he couldn't bring his love of his wealth. I mean, God's not against people having money if, if, it's, if he has them and has their hearts. God has all kinds of people, thank God. But for this man, this was his God. And when that one was put that way, you are either going to be in the kingdom of God or you're going to have your wealth. He went away sadly, didn't he? So this is a pretty good description of somebody who wanted to enter but wasn't able. Folks, we're going to have to come. God's going to put his finger on issues in every single life. And I say that to ones growing up here. God is going to put his finger on the issues of your life. It may be some ambition. It may be some desire for for a mate. It could be a thousand and one things that, you, that your life and your affections get fixed on. But I'll tell you, if we come to Christ, th those things are going to be laid on the altar. He is going to be Lord. But do you see this balance that you see in the Scriptures between the fact that we come to a place of surrender, which sounds very passive on the one hand, but there's also this battle, this fight to get to lay hold of that, I'm going to have to put forth everything that I've got into this battle. I want that more than I want my next breath. That's what it really comes down to, to enter into the kingdom of God. But I find in my own life, and I don't think I'm alone in this, that there are so many times when I'll come up against a need And I know theologically and scripturally what the answer is. I mean, I wouldn't dare say, God, you didn't prepare me for this. You didn't, you didn't provide for this. There's no, really, there's no real answer for this. I'm just stuck being who I am. This is who I am. That's all there is to it. I'm stuck. I mean, how many think that's the case? We all know it isn't. Either, Christ, either God has provided everything we need in Christ or he hasn't. So if he has provided everything and we're not walking in that, where is the issue? Is it with God? It's with me, isn't it? God is looking for people who are, who are going to be on board with him completely and, and looking to him and trusting in him and, and know, not only knowing that I have a need but being bold enough you see, there, there's got to be an assertiveness on my part. And that was, that was the kind of the reaction I had to something. I said, wait a minute. You know, I'm sitting here being a victim. I'm sitting here putting up with something when God has already told me what the answer is. I need to get up on my hind leg and say, wait a minute. I insist upon obtaining what Christ has provided for me. It belongs to me. God is looking for a greater boldness and assertiveness in his people to lay hold of what he has already paid such a high price to give us. That's the heart of the burden that I felt this morning. I, I, I see God saying, oh, I've done everything for you, and here you sit. God, help me to come to that place where I have that boldness. I'll tell you, we've got a God who values boldness. He values that, that kind of a heart that says, I will not accept anything less. In some ways I'm galloping through this, but that's all right. I'll tell you, God, the, the, thought, the central thought is, is such a simple one. But I just pray that God will, will get it through our thick skulls, what he's wanting from us today. He doesn't want us to go and say, oh, that was wonderful truth. 
praise God, and then go back to our lives like they are and not be changed by it. God wants to change me. He wants to change you, but you and I have a part to play. Are we going to seek him? Are we going to believe him? Are we going to actually stand on the promises? Or as my dad used to say, just sit on the premises. And that's what a lot of Christians do. Instead of standing on the promises, they're sitting on the premises, sleeping. When the Lord has done so much, he's given everything for us. Praise God. We rightly worship him. He alone is worthy of our worship. But, you know, one of, the, one of the scriptures that came back to me, and I, I guess we can turn to it so you'll know where it's at, is in Genesis 32, I believe. Remember, Jacob was one of the patriarchs, and he was a character. He did a lot of things his own way, and the Lord worked in spite of it. How many are glad the Lord works in spite of us? Yeah. He reaches us when we're in a condition of great need, and he begins to mold our hearts and our minds, and he brings us out of all, all kinds of things. Jacob was somebody who believed in the covenant. I mean, he valued the covenant, and he valued the, uh, the birthright that would have caused him to be able to step into the benefits of that covenant with God, the covenant relationship. His older brother Esau didn't care. Because one day he got really hungry and he traded his birthright for a bowl of, of soup or a bowl of beans or whatever it was. And so he despised that birthright. So in spite of the fact that, he, that Jacob cheated him out of it, what you see in him is a, is a heart that says, I want that. that. That matters to me. And God began to mold that and, and meet with him. And he had to flee from his brother and go to another country and wind up getting married and, and acquiring flocks and herds, and he starts back. In the process, God reveals himself to him in greater and greater ways and says, I'll, I'll go, you know, don't be afraid, I'm with you. And now, he, now he's coming back to meet Esau, though. And he remembers how it was when they parted. Esau was trying to kill me. And then he hears Esau's coming with 400 men. Whoa! <laughs> And he reacts just like you and I would. So he does everything he can think of to do. He separates his family into two groups, and he sends gifts ahead, and he just does everything he can naturally think of to do to try to mollify his brother's anger at him. And then he's left alone, isn't he? And it says in verse, 30, verse 24, is it? So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. And this is the reply. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Think of the boldness. Think of the, the brassy, I will not let you go. You, I, I've got to have, I was driven by need. But here is a man who was crying. He's, he's, he's talking to God. He's, I don't know if this is Christ or an angel, but whatever it was, he was not dealing with just a man. He was dealing with something more than that. And yet he has the gall, if you want to put it that way, to say, I will not let you go. How many of you think that God wants us to have that kind of a boldness with him? I'll tell you, God, didn't, God wasn't offended by this. This is really what God was looking for, was that sense of, I have got to have you. If I don't have you, I am a goner. I want you above all else, God. I need you. And there's this holy boldness to say, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And God blessed him. This has been the Midnight Cry broadcast. If you would like a DVD or CD of today's message in its entirety, please request it by program number. While it is not required, a donation of $10 for DVDs and $5 for CDs is suggested to help with expenses. 
Also, for those who request it, we will send you our quarterly publication, The Midnight Cry Messenger, free and postage paid. Send your requests to Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box 685, Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388. We invite you to join us again next week at the same time, and may God richly bless you until then.